Well, the most important change in this country is that of our people recognizing themselves as one. Uh, what I mean is this, we have been divided into racial groups, white people, black people, so that all that uh, was different, and be it in economic life, be it in ordinary social life, was based on this uh, black and white. Once you change this and you make our people feel that they're one, then all those things that uh, were divided uh, along those lines uh, could be solved. I have suffered, I have worked so hard for this country before independence, during the war. I worked so hard after independence to make our independence stick. And this man today turns around and he calls me a traitor. Me, a traitor, a man who worked for this country so much. There is no insult to be this one. <laughs> Yamas Baba, I Yamas Baba, I Namung and Telang Yamma, Minang Yamas Baba, Yamas, Minang Bonnebo Tong Winning, Masba, I Yamas Baba, Masba, I Ungazun Chaye, Yamas Baba. now that Zimbabwe is free and independent, the priority is now nation building, social and economic progress. We cannot move forward if we are divided. We have to work as a nation together. Zimbabwe has people of various colors, but they are one. They speak different languages, but they are one. They have different backgrounds, but they are one. Once we all understand that, once we give our best to our country, Zimbabwe is a wonderful country. We have resources. We have natural resources. We have human resources, as are not known in many countries. And therefore, it is us, the people of Zimbabwe, who should come together and see that Zimbabwe progresses. The most important thing in that progress is to see that there is peace and tranquility. Peace and tranquility. The observance of the rule of law. The return to our people that peace that they require for developing their country. To be able to do so, our law enforcing agencies must be free. <coughs> the army and the police must not be interfered with. They have their powers given them by the constitution of the country. No government must try and interfere with those powers. The army has its job to safeguard the security of the country, especially along the borders. The police have their job to see that there is peace and tranquility among the citizens of Zimbabwe. It is not necessary, therefore, 
It is not necessary, therefore, to have the police answerable to political parties. If the police have been and the army have been interfered with to, to this day, as we, as ZAPU, are certain will be in government as from next month. I want, I want to assure you here that the army and the police will be left to do their respective duties without interference from the government of PF Zapu. That there have been a number of little groupings who have usurped the powers and the functions of the police, you can be certain that those groupings will be removed. If those young people want to be in the police force, let them join the Zimbabwe Republic Police. No other little forces outside that main and the only constitutional force of this country. Comrades, I deal on the police and the army mostly because they are the essential organs in keeping peace and tranquility in the country and therefore they need that protection by the observance of the Constitution of Zimbabwe. The army. The army is the army and all its branches. There is no need for additional little political groupings. If you believe as members of ZAPU that when ZAPU is in power, you too will have your own little private armies, I say to you today, no. No private army. If, as you may have seen, there are little groupings of youths, political groupings of youths of political parties who have usurped the powers and the functions of the police. If you believe when ZAP is in power, you too will, be, you will indulge in police work, then let me tell you, you are not going to do it outside the police force of Zimbabwe, outside the Zimbabwe Republic Police. Yes, we are told. It, of course they will not get them. People in a number of cons constituencies in northern Matabeleland and southern Matabeleland find themselves being beaten up by people who call themselves Abafana, the boys. We had the boys during the war. The war is over. There is nobody who can claim to do the stupid things, the dissidency, in the name of Zabu. We know that they are agents of zanu -PF. I've told them that. Let them, let these criminals get out of these provinces now and let us have a free and fair election undisturbed by young people who have no respect for their parents who have no respect for their country who do evil things in the name of a party that is dedicated to peace and tranquility and that is Zap, pf zapu before we go any further may i introduce you to the other members of the joshua nkomo uh, museum board. In addition to myself as chairperson, there is Tandiwe Papra Nkomo Ibrahim. There is also Nyararai Sbanda, and uh, lastly, we have Dr. Godfrey Mahati, who happens to be the director of the National Museums and Monuments of Zimbabwe. We have Milili Tapela as the director uh, for the board. Ladies and gentlemen, 
this is part of uh, the Joshua Nkomo uh, lecture series. You may be aware we have heard this before. This year, we continue with another edition. Before I deal with that, let me say something very briefly about the men that we honor, about the men whose legacy we are trying to preserve for the posterity of coming generations. We are here talking about Joshua Nkabugo Nyongolo Nkomo, a man who played a leading role in the struggle for independence in this country. Started off as a trade unionist, became a nationalist, when they realized all these efforts were not delivering the goods, they then decided to resort to the armed liberation struggle. He ended up as the commander-in-chief of the Zipra forces, as from 1960, uh, 1977, he was uh, based in Lusaka, Zambia. He is a man who sacrificed a lot for the independence of this country. Having been incarcerated at Konab Zingwa, from 1964 to 1974, but he never gave up his fight for the liberation of this country. Now, we saw it fit that for a man who is an iconic figure, it was important that we preserve his legacy for the future of Zimbabweans. So we decided as the Joshua Nkomo Museum that one way of preserving that legacy was introduce the lecture series. This year, the edition that we are doing or dealing with is going to be hosted by none other than Siposami uh, Malunga, who happens to be the director of OSISA in Johannesburg, South Africa. He is the son of well-known nationalist uh, Sydney uh, Donald Malunga. May I, ladies and gentlemen, uh, present Siposami Malunga. The chairperson of the Joshua Nkomo Foundation and the Joshua Nkomo Museum and Memorial Library, Mr. Patisa Nyati, the trustees of the foundation, museum, and memorial library, the family of the late Dr. Joshua Nkomo, fellow Zimbabweans and comrades around the world. I am filled with a deep sense of humility and gratitude for the honor that the Joshua Nkomo Foundation and family has bestowed on me with this highly esteemed task of delivering the 2020 Joshua Nkomo Annual Lecture. I am pleased to inform you that none other than Dr. Joshua Nkomo himself joins us for this lecture. His spirit, values, and ideals and aspirations captured in his own words from Rhodesia's Gonakudzingwa's detention camp in 1964 when he said, and I quote, we set ourselves on a course to fight a wrong and bring about a new order where a person's skin color was treated as the accident that it was and not a passport to fuller life, end quote. This selfless courage to risk life, limb, and freedom in confronting injustice continues to inspire many of us more than half a century later. I will address much of my lecture to Dr. Nkomo. Dr. Nkomo, you may think that I am exaggerating when I say that we are currently living in truly momentous and extraordinary times. The entire world is locked down, with billions of people globally confined to their homes. In the face of a devastating virus that is determined to take as many lives as it can, invade and infect, the coronavirus, Dr. Nkomo, has forced most countries around the world to stop all travel, to ground aeroplanes, to seal off national borders, close schools and universities and shut down businesses and offices, close stores and accept those that sell food. It has also forced countries to shut down factories and stop all production. 
our way of life as we know it has vanished. Having been taught that humanity is about physically connecting to other humans, we now must avoid all contact. In order to deny the deadly virus a way to move between people, we wash our hands countless times daily. We wear masks and regrettably we avoid each other. We also fear each other. We fear the unknown. As we take refuge in our homes, the virus scours and rampages across communities, countries, regions around the world. It's taking lives. While scientists frantically devise ways to slow its spread or find a cure, it is safe to say that we are experiencing the most unprecedented events in our modern history. This virus has turned our world upside down. It has brought out the best in us, rekindling the collaborative human spirit of compassion, kindness, caring, love, and unity. But it has also brought out the worst, amplifying the scourge of hate, stigma, brutality, abuse, greed, selfishness, division, and exclusion. Dr. Nkomo, COVID-19 has exposed and magnified the fault lines in our societies and our world. It has brought out the strengths, but also magnified the flaws of our political leaders. It has exacerbated the suffering of the poor, the marginalized and the excluded sections of our society, who also happen to be the majority. It has reminded us so forcefully about the unfinished liberation project you started and left for us to complete. As most of us helplessly hide from the virus in our homes, we are shamelessly and shamefully aware that many of our people do not have homes to hide in. They do not homes to be logged in. And when, even when they do, doctor, they can scarcely afford to maintain the social distance that is prescribed to prevent and avoid infection. We are reminded that the majority of our people do not have food to eat. They did not have food to eat before the virus struck and they still do not have food to eat now. Worse, they are prevented from and unable to find any food. We cannot avoid asking ourselves the question how it is that a country that has undertaken the final act of liberation by taking back its land and redistributing it to its people still grovels for handouts from external donors and funders to prevent, in order to prevent its people from starving. We have time to think, Dr. Nkomo, about why it is that after claiming to have invested $3 billion to ensure food security in our country, more than half of the population faces starvation. We reflect on the fact that the majority of our people do not have the water that is required to prevent and avoid COVID infection, that they cannot afford the expensive sanitizer options. We are reminded that because the Zimbabwean health system collapsed years ago, years after you died, due to ineptitude, neglect, and corruption by the political elite who fly out of the country when they are ill themselves for their own medical care. Zimbabwe was never ready. It was never prepared for this deadly pandemic. Dr. Nkomo, it is safe. It is safe to tell you that nothing could have prepared us for this moment. Nothing could have prepared me to deliver this lecture virtually. Such is the time we live in. Dr. Nkomo, a lot has happened since you've been gone. Most of it is not what you would have hoped to happen. Allow me to elaborate. Following years of armed struggle, on the attainment of our independence, you clearly articulated your aspirations for a post-independent Zimbabwe when you said, and I quote, now that Zimbabwe is free and independent, the priority is nation building, social and economic progress, 
close quote. I regret to inform you that Zimbabwe has dismally failed to attain or even to advance any of these goals that inspired your struggle for liberation. I am saddened, Baba, and in fact enraged to inform you that the country has regressed to levels that I know drove you and your nationalist comrades to fight the racist, oppressive, and discriminatory Rhodesian regime. Let me share with you how the country has fared on the many issues that you cared so much about since you left us. The first is the unfinished struggle for constitutional democracy. The struggle you fought for, for our independence was without a doubt a struggle for democracy. Triggered by your desire to fight racist exploitation of black labor, you led the struggle for worker rights. But you quickly realized that the treatment of black workers was simply a symptom of a larger structural problem of undemocratic political power. The whites had power, the blacks did not have it. There could be no solution, doctor, unless and until political power was reconfigured and black people were allowed to vote in democratic one-person, one-vote elections. The fight for freedom and independence became synonymous with the fight for democracy. How can we ever forget that rally, Baba, in Harare in 1976, where you punched into the air, shouting people power, and then we demand majority rule now. A true Pan-African, together with your compatriots, Amilka Cabral, Kwame Nkrumah, Kenneth Kaunda, Julius Nyerere and Samora Michelle, among others, you internationalized the liberation struggle, inspiring an entire continent to demand self-determination from colonial rule. You, your armed struggle finally culminated in one person, one vote, with elections and multi-party democracy in Zimbabwe in 1980. But this would be short-lived. Your personal image and your contribution to the liberation struggle was vilified. Immediately thereafter, you were labeled a counter-revolutionary. Your access to the outside world was blocked. Zapu and Zipra leaders arrested, detained, killed. The party structures decimated and dismantled, and thousands of its supporters exterminated. As early as 1981, in the midst of severe political persecution, you despaired. Remarking that, and I open quote, the hardest lesson of my life has come to me late. It is that a nation can win freedom without its people becoming free. Close quote. It had become clear to you then and at that point that the democracy project was doomed from the beginning. Your liberation struggle aspirations for democracy were not shared by your erstwhile compatriot Robert Mugabe or Robert, as you called him. He wanted a one-party state and would stop at nothing to achieve it, including the murder of 20,000 innocent civilians. In, in the face of such atrocity, unable to protect your supporters with all your comrades in jail or in exile, you would make the choice, the tough and difficult choice, to capitulate with your comrades promised freedom. You would then proceed to be hailed as a Democrat, a nationalist. Your actions were hailed as acts of patriotism. You were hailed as a man who wanted a united Zimbabwe. Yet the truth laid bare to all was clear. You were Father Zimbabwe before independence. You remained so afterwards. 
You were always the epitome of unity and patriotism. It did not require the massacre of 20,000 of your supporters to become that. No doubt, every political decision you took was inspired by your strong sense of patriotism and nationalism. With Zapu conceding defeat on 22 December in 1987 in the unit accord, Mugabe would get his one-party state. The massacres would stop. Matebeleland and Midlands would regain peace. Zapu would disappear and multi-party democracy as we know it would die. Every subsequent attempt to resuscitate multi-party democracy would be met with brute force. When former ZANU-PF Secretary General Edgar Tekere, two boy, as they called him, resigned from ZANU-PF and became a new proponent for multi-party democracy, even forming his own party, the Zimbabwe Unity Movement, he would be reminded of Mugabe's resolve for a one-party state. His supporters would be violently attacked, and a senior leader in his party, former Goru Mayor Patrick Kombai, would be shot and left for dead by ZANU-PF Vice President Mzenda's security aides. Like Zapu, Zoom would disappear, and democracy would die again. Peace and stability would return. And I say again, democracy as we knew it would remain dead. A year after you died, Baba, former Zimbabwe Congress of Trade Union Secretary General, you may remember him, Morgan Swangirai, and his comrades decided to form a party, the Movement for Democratic Change and the resolve to challenge ZANU-PF political hegemony in the 2000 general elections. This was unacceptable for Mugabe's one-party state agenda. And he unleashed his template of violence on the new party and its supporters. The violence would fail to stop the MDC from winning up to 46% of the popular vote against ZANU-PF's 47%, a close race indeed. It was clear, and it remains clear, that considering this close margin of defeat, added to the allegations of manipulation of the voters' role, this is a constant problem in our country, the voters' role has continuously been manipulated in every election. The brutal violence that the MDC faced and suffered during the 2000 election and the subsequent challenge by the MDC of results in over 30 constituencies, many of which the courts never took the trouble to determine. It is safe to argue and say that the 2000 elections were arguably won by the MDC. Very few people would dispute that. But Mugabe had an army, which had sworn before the election to never allow the MDC to take power. Mugabe also had 30 free seats gifted to him in 1987 with the change in the constitution that turned him into an imperial president. He used all these instruments to retain power. Dr. Nkomo, the script has been repeated over and over again. Just like Zapu, in the 1980s, the main opposition party, MDC, is stifled. Its members are arrested routinely and they are detained, they are beaten and tortured and they are killed. During elections, the violence and bloodletting is especially heinous and bloody. In 2008, Morgan Swangirai defeated Mugabe in the first round of the presidential election. Mugabe would later reveal in a moment of senility that he had lost by as much as 70% to Morgan Swangirai. But the Electoral Commission, itself staffed with ZANU-PF functionaries, would later reveal, would later refuse to, re to release the results for up to 45 days. They would later determine that a runoff was required because nobody had won more than 50% of the vote. This was the opportunity to save Mugabe. In the runoff to the election, 
The violence template will be unleashed again, leaving over 300 MDC supporters dead and forcing Morgan Swangirai to withdraw from the runoff. To many Zimbabweans at the time, who were experiencing this for the first time, and who had no recollection of our unadulterated political history, all this was new. Mugabe and Zanu PF had presumably gone mad. The world was shocked at the levels of electoral violence. But to students of history and to purveyors of honesty, this was no different from the experiences that Zapu had had 26 years earlier. The script even had the same characters now with embellished titles, but still brandishing weapons and wearing military uniforms. This time round, Baba, Africa and the world would refuse to legitimize Mugabe's bloody election charade. Forcing him into a government of national unity or GNU as it became known widely. Yes, it was 1987 all over again. Some wondered whether this script was new, but those who had been around in 1987 knew that this was the same script, same characters, just a different time. Electoral democracy was again dead, killed by the men with guns, and then by ZANU-PF bureaucrats who count the votes and decide whose vote counts. Dr. Nkomo, it may surprise you to hear and to learn that one of the most egregious assaults on our democracy, on the tenets of our democracy in Zimbabwe, would occur in November 9, 2017. And in fact, it would be celebrated by the majority of Zimbabweans, by thousands and hundreds and thousands of Zimbabweans inside the country and outside. After you died, Robert, as you called him, consolidated his already imperial presidency. He stayed on, dismissing any comrade that had the audacity to question or challenge him, maintaining a cabal of psychophants, dedicating to maintaining the political status quo. Encouraged and indeed aided by his cronies, he would pretend to be serving at the leisure of the people whilst actively pursuing to be president for life. But he would grow old, as we all do. He would grow weak and senile. And in this, he would attempt to install his wife to take over. This would be a bridge too far for his comrades, who would unleash the army to remove him in a coup. You were always clear, Baba. That, and I quote, the police and the army are the most essential entities responsible for ensuring peace and tranquility in a country. And they need to be protected. They need the protection of the constitution. The most, more than any other in entities. You are strict in insisting that the police, they can never be a private army in a country. But your warnings, Baba, and I open quote, that it is not necessary to have the police and army answerable to political parties, close quote, would ring hollow in November 2017. As an army general, you remember him, he used to be in your zipra, took to national television to announce that the army had taken over to resolve a dispute within ZANU-PF and that it was actively pursuing criminals around the president, which was code for members of an opposing faction within ZANU-PF. This would lay bare the brazen pow power grab by this army, working very closely with the faction of the ruling party, would lay bare the conflation between state, ZANU-PF, and the military. It would expose for all to see that the self-styled Chimurenga aristocracy had unashamedly consolidated 
its power and control of both the country and our economy. The irony, Dr. Ngomo, would be that the coup would be celebrated by thousands of Zimbabweans who themselves were tired of Robert, as you called him, who falsely assumed that this, that Robert or Mugabe was the primary and only cause of Zimbabwe's decaying political context and situation, and that it was Robert who was responsible for the multiple crises, economic and political, that the country continued to suffer and face. With approving crowds on the streets, the coup would be dressed up and stage managed with malevolent genius, despite the brazen, ass brazen assassination attempts targeting members of the opposing faction in ZANU-PF, it would be sold as a soft, bloodless coup. Despite the support of Western diplomats who lended their support to it by being completely silent in the face of this significant challenge on our constitution, despite the silence of Sadak and the AU, despite the silence of all the Western countries who were fed up with Mugabe for his anti-imperialist mantra. But it would symbolize a crossing of the Rubicon and the point of no return for Zimbabwean democracy, signaling once again that democracy in Zimbabwe was not just dead, but it was buried. The second of your unfinished struggles is the unfinished struggle against tribalism and exclusion. Baba, some have deceptively tried to reduce you to a matabelelent tribal leader, a tag that you contemptuously rejected all your life. There is a reason why you and no one else is called Father Zimbabwe. You epitomized the quintessential Zimbabwean, one devoid of race, class, ethnicity, gender, or religious classification as thy primary characterization. The story is told by the late Sifa Msipa, your friend, of how, after receiving the results of the elections in 1980, you telephoned Mama Mafuyan, who was in Germany at the time, to inform her of Zappo's defeat. She responded by congratulating you, saying, I'm so happy. Before you could even respond, she continued, Oh, I'm so happy that you have won. I have already packed my bags. And if there was transport to bring me to Zimbabwe right now, I would have come. But unfortunately, I have to wait until tomorrow. Oh, I can't wait. You were shocked to hear her say this. And Mama Mafuyan had to explain and she said, I understand Smith lost and the Patriotic Front won. Were we not fighting for majority rule? I'm congratulating you for majority rule. That's what we got. Did we not get that? Your clarion call for joining the struggle of independence, Babankomo, was, and I quote, captured in your words when you said, we set ourselves on a course to fight a wrong and bring about a new order where a person's skin color was treated as the accident that it was and not a passport to a fuller life." Close quote. 
This defines your commitment to non-discrimination, equality and inclusion as founding values for any fair and just society. Your detractors knew that you were the ultimate and original Zimbabwe. You refused to be labeled, packaged and boxed into a single identity, whether racial, tribal, religious, gender or political. You rejected the false and deliberately misleading characterization of ZAPU as a developed party, even as everyone knew and the facts spoke for themselves. With more non debele leaders in his highest command serving as your deputy at different times, including James Chikerema, George Nandoro, Samuel Parrenyatwa, Josiah Chinamano, and Joseph Msika. You even rejected the notion of a Debele tribe, or a Shona tribe for that matter, rightly pointing out that these demographic characterizations were developed to serve colonial interests by collectivizing different ethnic groups into two broad categories. During the war, these values of non-discrimination were vigorously enforced. Ellenworth Pauli describes the policy at Victory Camp, which housed Zipra female cadres in Zambia. And I quote, No tribalism. You do not come from Gwanda. You come from this camp. You do not have a language of your own. The language you have is this camp's language. We do not want to hear anyone calling someone Shona, Ndebele, Venda, Kalanga. You are one from today onwards. Coming long before Amacha Sen beautifully debunked the illusion of identity as a social construct in his powerful essay, Identity and Violence, the Illusion of Destiny, in 2005. You rejected the compartmentalization of identity in any form, but most importantly, ethnicity. You recognized, long before Sen did, that no one has a single identity, and that in fact, for the most part, our multiple identities coexist comfortably until one of those identities seeks to dominate the others. And that to do so, the identity often resorts to violence. We recall how in 1981, you refused to accompany the then Prime Minister Robert Mugabe, who had started nationwide rallies speaking about his one-party state. In the same year, Mugabe had demoted you humiliatingly from his cabinet twice, first from the influential, influential position you held as Minister of Home Affairs, then to public service, and finally in the final act of humiliation to the nondescript and humiliating position of Minister without portfolio. When it came to planning his trips and rallies in Matebeleland, which you, interestingly, prefer to call the Western Province, Mugabe sent an emissary to ask you to join him for the materialism part of the rallies. Your reply was telling. It was that Prime Minister Mugabe was Prime Minister, and therefore he could go to any part of the country. You proceeded to ask Mugabe's emissary. He has already been to the rest of the country without me. Why does he want me now? The emissary replied, well, he likes to have with him members of parliament from the area he is visiting. Well, you responded. But the problem is that I'm not a member of parliament for Matebeleland. I am a member of parliament for Midlands. And the prime minister has already been to the Midlands without me. In the end, Mugabe would go to Matebeleland with Innocent Gala. Indeed, you were unhappy and worried about how the government seemed determined to encourage tribal politics in the country, remarking in one of your interviews after the election, which was reported by the Sunday Mail on 7 July 1985, and I quote that, 
I hope this is not a forerunner of things to happen in Namibia, South Africa when they attain their own independence. It is a tragedy to allow tribal states, close quote. Baba, there is an African proverb that goes as follows. When a leopard wants to eat its young, it first accuses them of smelling like goats. In the early 80s, wanting to destroy you and your party Zapu and its supporters and its base in Matebeleland and the Midlands, your detractors in ZANU PF accused Zapu of being in Debele party as a pretext to destroy it and to commit genocide on its supporters. We have not forgotten that throughout your persecution on manufactured, on, on manufactured tribal grounds, you insisted, and I quote, we cannot move forward. If we are divided, we have to work together as a nation. Zimbabwe has people of various colors, but they are one. They speak different languages, but they are one. They have different backgrounds, but they are one. Close quote. The third is the unfinished struggle for gender equality. Babanko, the struggle for inclusion not only remains unmet, but has actually regressed when it comes to women's rights and gender equality. Although you lived long before the Beijing conference, and died only four years afterward, after it. Your support and commitment to women's rights was unquestionable. You recognized the equal capability and contribution of women to the struggle. Your military win in Zipra established a fully fledged military training camp for women at Victory, Victory Camp in Zambia. You actively and equally promoted the study of women during the liberation struggle in preparation for independence. Indeed, some of the most inspiring, fiercely independent, and indeed fearless female politicians to have come out of our country came out of your movement, such as the late Ruth Chinamano, the late Tenji Lesabe, and the late Jane Nguenya. They all belonged to Zapu. And they were all senior cadres recognized equally in the movement. Dr. Nko, I am pleased to inform you that since you left, Zimbabwe has since had a female vice president, Joyce Mujuru, who served for 10 years, starting five years after you died. She would be unceremoniously booted out by President Mugabe, accused of every crime reserved for women in our country, including treachery, witchcraft, and seduction. Some women would join the male politicians angling for her job in the name calling and slut shaming. The country remains an unkind place for women, especially in politics, where they are marginalized, excluded, and abused by their male counterparts, with the ironic and twisted support of other women. In homes, they are exposed to unimaginable levels of violence and sexual abuse. As our country has all but completely collapsed, they bear the brunt and they carry the economic burden of fending for their families. They comprise the majority of our informal traders that now realistically sustains the economy as the government leverages 2% on every transaction that a Zimbabwean has with another. They are also the most vulnerable to violations of human rights. In the midst of COVID-19, they have been prevented from trading and their produce and their wares confiscated and cruelly destroyed and even burnt by the police. Reports and videos of violent, 
beatings and rape of women by police and the army are commonplace in our country now. The fourth unfinished struggle you left us, Dr. Nkomo, is the struggle for economic progress and decent livelihoods. After you died, President Mugabe and Zanu PF destroyed the economy. The country paid dearly for the unscheduled payment to the war veterans in 1998, which followed the massive looting of the war victims' compensation by the senior politicians in our country. The country paid dearly for the war escapade in the Democratic Republic of Congo, which was unplanned, which Mugabe unilaterally decided. Our Zimbabwe dollar crashed. It has never recovered. Our country is broke. We owe billions of dollars to everyone in the world. We no longer produce anything. We import everything. Our factories have closed. Unemployment is over 90%. 20 years after taking land from white farmers and giving it to black Zimbabweans, we still cannot feed ourselves. Half of the population faces famine because of a drought, which we were told we would be prepared for when the country invested $3 billion to a program called Command Agriculture, which was ostensibly aimed at ensuring our food security. That money disappeared. The country is not food secure. People are starving. Beneficiaries of the land redistribution program are yet to be issued with secure tenure. For the land that they have been allocated 20 years ago, beyond the mere offer letters that they hold and cling on to, which can be withdrawn under the whims of any official in ZANU-PF, should one cross that party. When the land redistribution program started, the political elite and their families took the best farms and they kept them for themselves. There is no security of title for anyone who crosses ZANU-PF. When you do, you lose your farm. Much the same way that Zapu lost his farms in 1980 when it crossed ZANU-PF. And much the same way that these farms were never returned to Zapu. We have gone back to pre-independence and to patronage times. We have achieved a world record for hyperinflation in the world. After Mugabe threw all economic sense and reason to the wind and printed money in bucket loads. After he died, Dr. Ngom, the government raided citizens' pensions and bank accounts. NASA, as you recall, which has the primary responsibility of housing all the pensions for people in the country, has been a citadel of corruption and plunder, leaving old people, including my mother and Mama Mafuyane's close friend, Umasband, queuing for days to receive, if at all they are able to, $50 of what is now a monthly equivalent of 15 United States dollars as a pension. Recall, Baba, that Umama worked for 42 years, serving the Bulawayo City Health Department as a nurse at Pelendawa Clinic, barely 100 meters from your home. But I want you to know that I have been a good son. I have taken care of her and I continue to do so. But many other old folk are not so lucky, Bob. Hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people in the country live desolate, desperate, and destitute lives. Many go for days without food. When they are sick, old people, as, they, as old people often do, they are unable to get any treatment because there are no medicines in the hospitals. 
There is no equipment. And often there are no doctors because the government fired them all when they demanded decent wages. The government fires anyone who demands decent wages. I wonder what you would think about this, Dr. Ngomo, a trade unionist, who fought and were inspired to join the liberation struggle by the exploitation of workers. When you hear this atrocity, Baba, women suffer the most in our country. They bear the burden as they did during the time of HIV and AIDS. They bear the burden of caring for the sick, for the children. Even now as COVID stares down on us, they will bear the burden of caring for the sick. When the economy crashed and tanked, many citizens left Zimbabwe. I was one of them. I'm sorry to say. They went to look for jobs elsewhere. They left their children under the care of their cocos, the old, whose plight was worsened later when the government took their pensions and wiped them away. I dwell on this point for you to understand the desperate levels our country has reached. I wonder, Baba, what you would do if you were still with us. I know that only you could reprimand Robert, as you called him. And at times, only you could bring him to his senses. After he died, all his compatriots could only sing him praises. Those that did not were ostracized and dismissed from ZANU-PF. Those that remained were too afraid. But eventually, Baba, they plotted to remove him at gunpoint. Robert's protege, Emerson Mnangagwa, is now in charge. Baba, the final of your unfinished struggle is actually the unfinished struggle to finish the struggle. Some have blamed you for failing to finish the struggle or all the struggles that you fought. They questioned the many decisions that you took at different momentous occasions and times in the history of our country. Why, they ask, for example, did you sign the Lancaster House Agreement in 1979? Why, they ask, did you accept the results of the elections in 1980? Why, they ask, did you instruct ZAPU forces or ZIPRA forces to lay down their arms at Intumbane in 1980? Why, they ask, did you sign the Unity Accord in 1987? Why did you join Mugabe in the government of national unity? I have had similar questions and similar blame laid against your friend and compatriot Nelson Mandela in South Africa. With the comfort of distance and time, it is easy to pass judgment on you, Bob, and all your other compatriots, and to criticize your decisions and choices. But is it fair? We did not walk in your shoes. Nor did we leave your reality. What do we know? We do know without a doubt that you were a man of peace. We know that you were a patriot, a democrat, and a nationalist. We know that you sacrificed a lot for our freedom. You risked your life. You lost your freedom. You sacrificed time with your family. You suffered immense indignity and persecution for your beliefs and your convictions. You watched your comrades, cadres, and people die in their thousands simply because they believed in you and the cause that you had inspired them towards. You did what you did. And clearly, we must do what we must do. Your country, Zimbabwe, Baba, desperately needs you now. It needs another you to save it. Your simplicity, your humanity, humility are sorely demanded and required and missed now. Your social welfare 
and social justice wiring was captured by Judith Todd, who I love so much, who herself is a great heroine of our struggle for independence, for her support to our liberation fighters. Judith described how she wanted to make an appointment to see you after you had been kicked out of government by Robert Mugabe. You told Mama Judith to get into a taxi outside any hotel in Bulawayo and you instructed the driver and instructed the driver to take her to Nkomo's house in Pelandao. They all know where I stay, you told Mama Todd. When Mama Todd got to the house after your bodyguards ushered her in, she describes that it was like walking into a nightmare. Over 50 people were in your lounge, some with broken bones, some with bruises, and all many of them with bloody bandages. You were personally working the phone, trying to raise money to help them all. And you were saying, even just $10, even just $10, shouting on the phone. Baba, who is going to be our Joshua Nkomo now? In the face of a collapsed health sector, where hospitals have no medicines and equipment, where doctors and nurses are overworked and underpaid, where patients cannot afford the expensive medication that is prescribed if they are lucky to be able to be seen by a doctor. In an economy Baba, that serves a small corrupt political and military elite, in a country that has no water, no electricity, no money, no fuel, no hope and no responsible and responsive leadership, in a country where it is hard to get one's hands on just $10 40 years after independence. Baba, you once said, and I quote, the country will never die. Young people will save it. Close quote. We know that it is the young people who liberated our country. We know that due to your call to people, young people to stand up and fight for the liberation of the country, many walked out of high school, walked all the way across the border, found their way in Zambia to fight the liberation struggle. They fought and they died for us to be free. You, of course, know that my own father Sydney, your protégé, was in his late twenties when he was first jailed by Ian Smith and was only 40 years old when he was released to go to Lancaster House to be part of the negotiation for our independence. Who will inspire our young people now? Who will inspire them to see hope in the middle of despair, to seek justice in the face of abuse, to speak out when they are silenced as they are often, as they are, as they are often uh, silenced by the government, to demand change, Baba, in the face of an exploitative and violent political culture, to stand up and be counted as you did, as you encouraged them to do in the 1960s and 70s. And when you, as you asked young people to liberate our country from the racist oppressive rule, to resist authoritarianism and to fight the elites that have captured our country and our state. Who will inspire our young people to save our country? Who is our Joshua Ngomo of today? Perhaps, Baba, we should not ask you to come back. You should stay where you are with your comrades. 
You did your part. You played your role. You liberated our country. It is not your fault that we failed to defend the liberation that you fought for. It is our responsibility to do so. It is for us and for all who are listening, especially the young people out there, in whose future the future of the country matters the most. It is for them who will know and understand and appreciate your values and your ideas and everything that inspired you to pick up the button and to continue where you left off. I thank you. I thank you, Baba. I thank you for your contribution. I thank you for fighting for our freedom. I thank you for today. I'm sad, saddened, and perhaps enraged that I have nothing to celebrate for your efforts. God bless Zimbabwe. Ishe Komborera, Zimbabwe. Nkosi Sigelela, Zimbabwe. Nyabonga. Tinotenda. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Nkomo family and the trustees of the Joshua Nkomo National Foundation, I would like to express our profound gratitude to Mr. Siposami Madunga for excellently and brilliantly delivering this very informative memorial lecture on the life of our late father, Dr. Joshua Mkabu Gonyongolo Nkomo, also widely known as Father Zimbabwe. He is also lovingly known as Umtalawetu. This lecture has truly been a special remembrance and celebration of the life of the icon, even more so on this very special day of our independence from colonial oppression, which we all know that Dr. Nkomo spent all his life fighting against. I'm also grateful to Mr. Malunga for bringing out the other side of Dr. Jane Nkomo, being that of the personal human qualities side that, that Dr. Nkomo possessed such as the fatherly, nurturing qualities that made him so loved and trusted by many people, irregardless of whether they knew him personally or not. I also find it most befitting that Mr. Malunga should be the one to deliver this lecture today because Mr. Malunga's father, the late Honorable Sidney Malunga, and my father, Dr. Jane Komo, go back a long, long way they were very close and closely worked together as well. They also shared the same vision and beliefs for the future and well-being of our country. Indeed, both men had the rare courage and conviction that only persons of their leadership caliber could possess. As a family and the foundation, we fully recognize and endorse the delivery of this annual memorial lectures as a way of honoring and keeping alive the memory of the late Dr. Jane Como, and as well of keeping alive the vision and the values of one of Zimbabwe's most illustrious sons. And as such, we call upon the citizens of Zimbabwe to deliver as many memorial lectures on Dr. Como as they possibly can. Truly, there can never, never be enough said about this great man. This is important so as to enable the nation and the future generations to continue to be inspired by the deeds, the great deeds of this great man, by passing on his noble and lofty values and principles to the next generations. The Dr. Nkomo National Foundation is sought to do just that by the establishment of the Joshua Nkomo Memorial Museum, which chronicles the life and times of Dr. Joshua Nkomo from birth right through to death. 
The museum has seen thousands of school children from the Bulawayo province and from the Matebelele and South province visit it over the years. And we invite you all to pay a visit to the museum, which is situated at the late Vice President's residence at Macham Shope in Ibulawayo. Once again, I would like to thank Mr. Sipo Sami Malunga for delivering this most educational letter and, to, and the public at large for joining us upon the delivery of this lecture. I thank you all and God bless you and protect you all at this time of the pandemic.